Hey guys, Robert J. Morris here. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Skull322 on Twitter for uh, the link here. Um, the headline reads, uh, IPM, uh, IPM, IBM shows first full error detection for quantum computers. Um, I'm sure I might have mentioned it uh, in the past. Um, there's been a lot of events recently, and I've kind of dropped the ball slightly. However, I am still working on my quantum computing series. Um, just so you know, I'm not full of horse shit. Um, there's uh, actually, uh, you know, just some little bits and pieces like it's a, it's a narrated kind of a thing the actual spin direction is not so much spin it doesn't update because I'm recording on the screen but you can see basically um, you know I get I, I talk about superposition I talk about how quantum computing works um, and then the implications of such uh, processing I guess you could say um, and that's what I'm going to talk about right now. This will make more sense later when I've finished this series. Um, like I said, it's going to be rather in-depth. It's going to cover all the basics. Now, we call these registers that hold Boolean or binary state information bits. A bit stands for binary digit. And once again, this value can only be a 1 or a 0. Some programmers out there will argue that it can be unassigned or null, but don't. Anyway. So you get the idea. So I am working on that. Um, this does expand into a whole plethora of other subjects, this quantum computing, because yes, as with everything else, these things are connected, guys. Um, anyway, I did want to cover this article, which, like I said, will become more clear as to its importance later. Um, but it's basically about um, quantum computing and error correction. One of the things plaguing... Uh, I would have to say the um, the public uh, the public programs that are researching these um, biggest problem is reliability, data integrity in quantum bits or qubits. Because <clears throat> while they're not in a, uh, a state of superposition, they are literally just like regular bits, just like a regular computer with a zero or a one. But here's what makes them kind of fun to work with: is that while they're in a state of superposition. Um, they can be both zero and one. How is that important? Well, it gets into the coefficients that determine its uh, its flip state, or it, it and but these coefficients though are hard to read. So what they have to do is use quantum entanglement between two uh, neighboring qubits, and then they can observe the effects on each other um, because if you look at a qubit directly its superposition gets lost the coefficients uh, get also lost and it just turns into a zero or a one or a regular bit so what they do is they use quantum entanglement to in a sense um, get a sneak preview or, or a flipped ver version of the other bits now this is where reliability comes in you have to also use quantum entanglement and other observation techniques in order to do error correction. Now, error correction is often used uh, for data reliability. Uh, you know, back in the old day, uh, you know, you, well, they still use it. Uh, cyclic redundancy checks or CRC checks are, are, are still used um, for things like, uh, um, what do you call it, uh, chromatic, uh, chromatic distortion I think in fiber optic lines because your you know your photons are bouncing off the walls of fiber optics so there's lots of uh, error correction routines written into uh, that kind of stuff as well why is this important well first off you know the, if you go to D-Wave's website they say that they've they've got a thousand something qubit machine I don't know if they're using uh, um, like 8-bit like uh, or 8-qubit uh, or not. I know IBM is using 4 and that's a 2x2 two two. so what they're doing is they're using a 2x2 two two matrix of qubits um, that are super like you know they're, they're in superposition state they can be entangled with each other. Now that said uh, this is what we know publicly. Guys I am doing um, in the series I will be covering DARPA and one of the big companies they work with, and a lot of you may know the name Raytheon, that is basically 
who's responsible for most of the development of the quantum computers that the NSA is using. And yes, this is a DARPA hard problem, guys. And DARPA is involved in on this. And I believe personally that they, they've already figured this out. IBM is just, uh, they're just, they're just taking the lead here on this uh, publicly. Um, but these are the things that we have to start looking out for, guys. Um, the... The, the, the sheer magnitude of the capabilities of data processing um, with these quantum computers is revolutionary on a level that, you know, the scale is so huge that just standing in front of it, you don't know how big it is, okay? So, you know, you know when you'd hear things like... Uh, Oh, we could never have transporter technology because there's no computer on the planet that could literally database every single particle or atomic or atom in your body. Well, guess what? With quantum computing, this actually becomes more feasible, even plausible. So, like, I'm not saying the teleportation technology. I'm talking about the data handling capability. Okay. So, uh, yeah, so quantum computers must overcome the challenge of detecting and correcting quantum errors before they can fulfill the promise of sifting through millions of possible solutions much faster than classical computers. Um, so, yeah, with the error correction routines that they got here, um, it kind of just goes into some detail of um, our recent 4-bit qubit network. We build a system that allows us to detect both types of quantum errors. Um, yeah, there's bit flip errors and phase errors. Look, I'm not going to get into what those represent right now. That'll be in the um, in 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 the video that I'm working on or in the series that I'm working on. Um, it does say here, like briefly, like what it is. So you can come to the article. I will post it in the description, as I mentioned. Um, yeah, it goes detecting quantum errors is anything but straightforward. Classical computers can detect and correct their bit flip errors by simply copying the same bit many times and taking the correct value from the majority of error-free bits. By comparison, the fragility of quantum states and qubits means that trying to directly copy them can have the counterproductive effect of changing the quantum state. Like as I, as I mentioned, as soon as you observe a qubit, it solidifies its one or zero-ness. <laughs> and anyway, that said, you know, it can be kind of tricky. And let's see here. Um, this is an interesting thing, by the way. And I don't know if this is just a coincidence, but you know how I feel about coincidence. Um, this happens to be uh, the year, uh, I think it's the 50th, yeah, 50th anniversary of Moore's Law. Moore's Law is about... Uh, the doubling of transistors on a on a on a um, microprocessor, basically, and they will double, 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 double to a point where you can no longer fit any more transistors because the transistors just get so small or the chip gets so big. I mean, it's that simple. Now, thing uh, the other thing to think about is the smaller you make these pathways that carry electrons. I mean, once you get to a, to a submicron size. I forget the actual limit. I think it's 0.8 microns. I can't exactly remember. Or eight micro. I can't. Re I can't recall the number. But it's there. And the thing is, is you can no longer reliably push, push electrons down these pathways because they just get too damn small. And that's that's why they're switching to, um, you know, with, with the uh, uh, what you call uh, metamaterials and uh, and nanotech. Now they're able to use optical circuits, and they can create, uh, you know, anything from carbon nanotubes uh, that can carry photons or electrons. Like they, they're really, really starting to um, um, get pretty tricky. And like I was saying before, a lot of people don't realize that the biggest revolution known to man right now is molecular, uh, like molecular physics, and 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 creating metamaterials from like basically you know from the atomic level up you know when they can make their own designer molecules you gotta think man that's some scary shit you can make any kind of material that you need for a specific function or purpose and you can make it as small as you fucking want anyway that said um look it is the 50th anniversary of moore's law um 
They've been building processors for 50 years, if you just read between the lines. Eh? <laughs> anyway, um, that's neither here nor there, just kind of interesting. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, here it is. Such advances seem timely as we celebrate the 50th anniversary of Moore's Law, which predicted the annual doubling of circuit components that can be packed into the integrated circuits of classical computers. The anniversary has provided an opportunity for plenty of renewed speculation about when Moore's Law might end. Well, and then uh, you got here... Uh, da, 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 da. They had to go into... They talk about... Uh, yeah, the stuff here, you're, you're probably not going to get most of it unless you have a background in this area or if you do, you know, a little bit more research, which this is why I'm putting together. There's a, there's a few good, there's a few good, uh, um, um, like lectures or, or classes on this kind of stuff, some really good animated stuff, but I'm working on my own, um, series because it does take its own little slant when I start talking about, uh, who's funding the research and where the research is. And I will say this, I have one concern, well, I have lots of concerns about quantum computing. Um, I like what it represents, I like how powerful it could be, what I don't like is who has it and who doesn't. Right now, it's dangerous because unless we have it too, it's dangerous. And that's the bottom damn line. The powers that be have it, they're going to have the uncrackable codes. They're going to be cracking every single code. Like, this is a danger. Like, we need to have this quantum computing capability as well. If we can have a level playing field, because if not, they are going to they are going to turn this thing upside down. They're going to pull the fucking rug from under us, and everyone's fucked. Uh, they're trying to make everyone dependent on the computer. So, imagine if they rule the roost, so to speak. Anyway, guys, I want people to learn as much about this shit as possible because this is, like I said, way out of left field. And not too many people don't even, they don't even have a clue what it represents and what it is. So um, I'm going to start bringing it to people's attention and uh, try and find a friendly and uh, clever way to uh, explain it without boring the living shit out of you. So anyway, with that, um, get on to the next. I just wanted to point this out. I'll leave the article here in, uh, in the description. I know it's kind of out of left field, but this is very interesting shit. Stand by. Um, I am working on my video uh, about quantum computing, D-Wave, Raytheon, DARPA, the ARPANET, and its original design. When we actually got to use it, they were using it for two decades, two or three decades before we even got onto AOL, guys. So, like... There's so much you guys need to know, and like you think you're using YouTube, and you think you have like information that you, and we're running. No, we don't know shit. We haven't been running shit. We're just allowed to use it. We're sitting in the passenger seat, and that's the whole fucking point. And they can shut it down anytime that they want. So, just think about that, guys. And uh, other than that, have a nice day. Okay. <laughs> uh, peace out. Take care of each other. Please. All right. Peace out. <laughs>